Good evening. Seventeen verses, three hundred and twenty-seven words thereabout that were read for us just a moment ago detail the most important event in all of human history. Just seventeen verses and just three hundred and twenty-seven words. But one of the profa profound things that's found in there is the way in which the earth itself even reacted to the event. We know from the accounts that there were earthquakes. We know that in Matthew's account it talks about those that were dead in the tombs coming forth. Here it says, the sun's light failed. I don't know how many were able to see the eclipse a couple weeks ago, but if you were able to see that, it, it was something that was a pretty humbling event for, it seemed like an hour or more. It steadily got a, a little darker and darker and darker until the sun was completely obscured by the moon. However, in a moment, in an instant, a little bit of the sun shined through. And when that little bit of sunlight shined through, everything seemed to wake up again. It was an awesome event that only lasted about four to six minutes, I think it was. When Jesus was on the cross, the, sun fail, the uh, sun's light failed and it didn't shine again for three hours. In, in my neighborhood, when that happened, the birds even started acting weird. The dogs and even the coyotes down in the nature preserve area started howling. It was a, an awesome sight. It was almost like you could feel it. And it only lasted, like I said, for about four to six minutes. Three hours, the sun was darkened on that occasion. Tonight, I want us to, to talk a little bit about that and see if there's some things that we can gain from it. But more than anything else, to understand that though we're not told exactly what it was that was going on, we do know who was working at that moment, that God was the one who caused the sun's light to fail. And I think there's some very important lessons in that. So that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. So if you're ready for the three words, let's see the notebooks again tonight. Very cool. Awesome. Okay, the three words, and these are going to play a huge part. Darkness, obviously, is one of them because I think there's something that's very, very important about the darkness and why that darkness was there. Also, we're going to be looking at the fact that that darkness seems to be applied to God's judgment upon especially the nation of Israel, but it teaches us a great lesson as well. And then the light, how powerful light is. Light is what Jesus describes himself as being when he came into the world. He's the one who illuminates things. It shines even on those, uh, those people and places and things that don't want to be seen, and yet Jesus still shines light upon them to show exactly what they are in reality so that we may avoid them, especially if they're fleeing from the light. So again, when we were talking about the eclipse, and when you look at the, the idea of what the eclipse is in this black and white photo of what an eclipse looks like, and the moon is, is steadily moving in such a way in the earth and, and things such as that to where the moonlight comes between, or the moon itself comes between the earth and the sun. And in my lifetime, I've seen eclipses before. I don't know that I've ever seen a total eclipse. Seems like there may have been one when I was a child that me and maybe Moses were watching together. I don't know. But I, I don't remember anything being like that. That was such an awesome thing to see. All over the internet, there were photos and things being said. There were people who came from all over the country that came to Texas in order to see the event. I think there were well over a million people who journeyed here so that they may witness the total eclipse of, of the sun on that occasion. And it steadily grew darker and darker until it was fully eclipsed. But even as it was moving in that direction and that darkness was steadily creeping in, you could tell that it wasn't because there was darkness that was creeping in so much as it was just the light itself being ob obscured. And so even when there was that total eclipse, you could still see that ring of the sun around it. And you probably won't be able to see on the screen, but what was also really interesting is you could see the stars. In the middle of the day, like one o'clock in the afternoon, you could see stars. And that was an awesome thing to see. It made you feel very small, at least it did me. It made me feel very small. It made me feel very insignificant and powerless to know that this is just something that God set up in order and it came that uh, place in time to where the moon came between the sun and the earth and blocked the sun. And yet God could cause that and something similar to that, something more powerful than that, at any time he so desired. 
But as I said also, when we think about that darkness that was there, that was so much that you could feel, as soon as the sun started to peek around the moon once again, everything brightened up and everything got normal. It didn't take very long at all for things to become illuminated and bright again. And I think there's some really important lessons that we can gain from that, especially when we go back to the day in which these things happened, that there was darkness. And I appreciate Josh reading that. And I asked him specifically to read from the ESV because the ESV says something a little bit different in verses 44 and 45 than some of the other versions, especially when you look at verse 45. The New King James says the sun was darkened. Many of your versions may have that. ESV says that the sun's light failed. Jesus has been on the cross for several hours. As Josh mentioned, he has endured mockery. He's in the, the most torturous moment of his life and is suffering greatly. And that moment of time, he has been praying for those who inflicted this torture upon him. And there it says that the sun's light failed. Some of the versions that, that use certain manuscripts use a word for darkened that means obscured. You may have that as a footnote in your Bible. ESV comes from manuscripts that uses the word that is very similar to eclipse, eclipo, which means to give out, to die out. And that word is only used a few other times in scriptures. As a matter of fact, it's only used four times in all. Here's the other three. Luke 16, 9, where this man is uh, trusting in money and how to make money and live by money. It says that make friends of yourselves by unrighteous mammon that when you fail, when you give out, when you have nothing left, when you fall, when you collapse. Luke 22, 31, when uh, Peter was being told by Jesus that before the night's over with, you're going to deny me. And he says that I've prayed for you that your faith should not fail. It's not the idea of being obscured with that word. It's not the idea of something coming between him and Jesus. It's the idea of failing, falling. Hebrews 1 verse 12 is one of the ones I think is really good when it talks about like a cloak you will fold them, speaking of our God, and they will be changed. But you are the same and your, your years will not fail. The ESV uses that term and I think it's very unique and different than the other terms because it means that the sun's light stopped shining. It may be that there was some type of an eclipse. It may have been. It may have been that the, the clouds became so thick that day. Or it could be that just God told the sun, stop shining. And stop shining until this event takes place. But there was darkness over the land. And that word that's used for land is also a word that could mean the entire earth. It may be that it was limited or it may be the entire earth. There's a lot of things we don't know about it, but this is what we do know. It's because God did it. And God was speaking to his, to his creation at this moment of time because of what was taking place. The Son of God was being murdered. The Son of God was hanging upon a cross, and God's judgment was at hand. There's often times in the Scriptures where darkness is a metaphor to talk about God's judgment. Zephaniah, Joel, these are two other verses that you can look up to speak of this. But the ones in Amos, I think, are very powerful. Amos chapter 5, verse 20 says, Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? Then in Amos 8, verses 9 and 10, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. It will turn your feasts into mourning and your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like mourning for an only son and it's in like a bitter day. Now Amos is not even speaking about the day that Jesus was crucified, but it sounds very much like it. Amos is, and these other prophets are talking about the doom and destruction that was coming upon God's people for their idolatrous practices and turning their back on him and about the judgment that was coming. But the, the symbol that is used is the symbol of darkness. And this type of darkness that says, is it not very dark with no brightness in it? When we saw that eclipse and that, that moon was there, even though it was a total eclipse, you could still see that band of light around the, the outline of the moon. On this day in which Jesus died, there was this darkness that fell upon the earth, that fell upon the land. And it was one that I believe was pronouncing God's judgment on his people for turning away from him. There's a lot of things that sometimes when we look at passages such as that, and we realize that God is... is passing his judgment on his people. 
But one thing that we don't need to, to think about, and this is in, I just want to make this as a side note, John 16, verse 32. Sometimes when people look at the cross, they feel like the darkness was because God was turning his face away from Jesus. And that Jesus was taking the sins of the world in the, uh, in the sense of him being guilty of them. It's called imputation. That by him taking our sins, he became guilty of lying. He became guilty of adultery. He became guilty of uh, sexual immorality and all the sins that we committed. The scriptures do not teach that anywhere. It's a misapplication of, of several verses. John 16, 32, Jesus said, The hour is coming, yet, yes, now has come, that you will be scattered each to his own house and will leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. When we see Jesus on the cross, we do need to see that this is judgment being pronounced upon the people. It's not upon the Son. God was still with him, and God was still there with him. One of the ways that we're, which we note is one of the statements that Jesus is going to make in just a few moments. But at this particular moment of time, what we see is that this crucifixion was the final straw for Jerusalem. They had had Jesus with them for three years. They had had all the prophets before. They had had all the great miracles that were done and all the great proofs of who God was. And they had turned their back on him at every opportunity. And because of this, this was the final straw. When you back up in the context, let's go back to Luke chapter 23 and notice verses 27 through 30. Luke chapter 23, this is as Jesus is being led away to the cross. Verses 27 through 30. And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, the wombs, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. And so what Jesus is saying is that the same thing that he basically talked about in places like Matthew 24, destruction is coming upon Jerusalem, and it's going to be coming very soon. Many of you will be alive when it happens. And in that day, it would be good if you did not have children or were nursing because it would be very difficult for, for you to flee in that short amount of time that you're going to be given. And it would be better for you to have mountains fall upon you than to suffer the affliction that people are going to suffer at that occasion. The crucifixion was judgment upon the world for its sins, but specifically because the Son of God had been rejected by them and judgment was coming. This was the final straw. When I saw that eclipse the other day, it was a very powerful thing. And it was one that showed just how small and insignificant we all are on this earth. But that was, in many senses, a somewhat random event. Time and chance had happened in just the right order for it to come about. This was God saying, I see what has happened, and my judgment is coming upon you. It's a gruesome sight indeed. At that particular moment of time, though, there is this glimmer of hope that is there that in many ways would have seemed uh, heartbreaking to them as well. But the temple is torn, or the curtain in the temple is torn. And what it tells us is that in Hebrews 9, verses 11 through 14, it talks about the way in which now we have that access to God. This morning we talked about the Word became flesh. And because the, the understanding of God was made known to man by the person of Jesus Christ, and that Jesus was the one who was constantly telling people, come unto me, that as he tabernacled amongst us, it was not like the holy of holies where no one could go in and not have access to God. But in Hebrews 9, verses 11 through 14, it tells us that the word became flesh, and this is another reason for it. By, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered to the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So you have two things that are happening at, on this occasion. The, the sun goes dark. It fails to give its light. And the reason being is because of the judgment that's coming upon them because of sin. But at that same moment when Jesus is dying, the veil, the temple, and the curtain 
in the temple is torn. And that same event that causes the sun to not shine causes that curtain to tear. Because now we all have access to God. We read from Hebrews 2 this morning that it had to be that Christ died. It wasn't a matter that he could just save mankind any way that he saw fit. The scriptures, God's own mouth reveals it had to be this way. This is the price that had to be paid for our redemption. Sin has to have punishment placed upon it. And there is a place of eternal darkness that is awaiting sin. But now we all have access to God through that same Christ who was mocked, who was beaten, and who was crucified. It's an awesome event. I don't know that I will ever think about an eclipse like we had the other day the, the same way. Subtle reminders. I don't know how often it is that we, after it rains, we had a ton of rain yesterday that we needed, that we're blessed with. I don't know how many of us may have went outside to try to see the rainbow that God promised. Unfortunately, even the rainbow itself has been corrupted to say something that it was never intended to say and to represent people who it never was intended to represent. But it's still God's promise and probably one we don't think about a whole lot. Events like that that happened the other day should be a good reminder to us that God is the one who is in control and God is the one that we live for. That on that cross you had a sufferer who was a righteous individual, a righteous person. The thing that Jesus said in verses 46 through 49, that when he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That's a quotation from Psalm 31 and verse 5. In Psalm 31 and verse 5, when you read that whole psalm, what you see is that there's a righteous man who's being uh, preyed upon by his enemies. And he's praying to God for deliverance, that he would be his rock of refuge. The first five verses, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me. For you are my strength. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Jesus was not carrying the sins of mankind and that he was the one who had actually committed these sins. He was the one paying the price for the sins of mankind. The price that was rightly due to us. But Jesus still trusted in his God. That even though Jesus himself had to trust that, God, I'm going to allow myself to be delivered into the hands of my enemy. But I trust you. And as into your hands I commit my spirit. This is going to cost me physical life. But into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus trusted and believed in the promise that the Father himself had made to him. That he was going to be resurrected. The promise that Jesus himself spoke of. It gives us hope when we read that passage. That even as that sun was being darkened by the, the uh, moon a few couple weeks ago, I had full confidence that the sun was going to reappear. I know a lot of people didn't. I was asked by a few people, is there any biblical significance to, to this? And there were a lot of people who were predicting, some of the predictions said that this darkness was going to last for four and five days, and then the end was going to come. It was amazing the kinds of things that you saw. But to, that seemed very silly to me. But think about what it was like for three hours. Will the sun ever shine again? Giving yourself so totally to God that you're going to go into the grave and you're going to be there for three days and then come forward. It's, it's not really amazing that his own disciples would have been confused by such a thing as that. When Jesus speaks these words, into your hand I commit my spirit, he do, does so as a righteous sufferer and one that's going to be trusting in the power of God to deliver him from those things. He's trusting God for the very thing that was promised, and that is the resurrection. Again, that's something that ought to give us hope. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, when it speaks of hope, he says it's like an anchor of the soul. It's sure and steadfast. And notice that it enters the presence behind the veil. Remember that, that 
curtain was torn, and now access to the very throne of God is there. It enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner, we spoke of our captain this morning, our forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. We also have in places like Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching, that what we see with this is that it gives us hope to know and to be able to say the same thing that Jesus said, into your hands I commit my spirit. That there's so many difficulties, there's so many trials, there's so many things that cast us down. There's so much darkness that's in the world, but into your hands I commit my spirit. That is like an anchor that is tied to the very throne of God. And when we go through certain difficulties, when we go through trials and tribulations, when we are tested at every turn, aren't you thankful that you have that rope that you can hold on to and know that it's not coming loose? When everybody else in the world forsakes you, that you have that rope that's tied to the very anchor of God, that when you go to the doctor and he doesn't tell you good news, that you've got that anchor that is tied to the very throne of God, and that nothing in this world can cause it to come loose. That it is there because that veil was torn. It is there because there was darkness. There was judgment upon sin. And it's there because Jesus has already entered that place. Because he committed himself to his God. And it gives us that same hope. When you think about that centurion, go back to Luke chapter 23. And notice verse 47. Luke chapter 23 and verse 47. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God saying, this, certainly this was a righteous man, an innocent man. This man was innocent. He was righteous. And really when people see us going through the trials that we go through, and if we have that type of steadfastness that's being spoken of, that's the goal of much of it. And so that people will see I can make it through. There is hope. Everything is not helpless and hopeless. That there is a God, and this God has helped many. And because of that, we can have that same trust. Jesus sets the example, even in death, of what it means to go through these things and brings about glory to God. And others. In verse 48, I love the way that the ESV wrote this. I'm going to read it from the New King James first. It says, The whole crowd who came together to see that sight, the ESV uses the word that spectacle. That spectacle. It almost sounds like it was a, a circus, a farce, just some thing to see along the way, to be entertained by, to be mesmerized by. To wonder by. But the whole crowd that came to see that spectacle, it says that when they saw what had been done, that they beat upon their breasts and they returned home. And all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Another thing that we see there is it brings about conviction. In Acts 2, verses 36 through 41, this is what Peter is referring to when he's preaching that sermon about Jesus and who he is, and he tells them, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this Jesus whom you crucified has been made both Lord and Christ. And these people were cut to the heart as a result of that. The quick, I think some of the older versions would say. And what it means is when you go to pull a, a, a hanging fingernail off and it pulls that bit at the bottom and the skin with it that hurts and has that searing pain, that's what the idea is. This is what their hearts felt. Something had been removed and it was a searing pain. They were cut to the heart and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? 
And Peter tells them exactly what they needed to do. They were guilty of killing the Son of God. The earth was darkened because of what they did. The earth quaked. Dead got up out of the graves because of what they had done. And Peter's solution is very simple. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because this promise that was made was made to you and to your children and to many as are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And then he testified with a lot of other words, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received his word were baptized. There were about 3,000 that day that responded. It's amazing how powerful God's word is, especially as we saw this morning, when that word becomes flesh and hangs on a cross and dies for the sins of mankind. This is what that righteous sufferer was teaching and showing to the people. I have no idea why Siri's on there. <laughs> Evidently, she's got a, a recommendation for me. All right, after the eclipse. So as I said, the sun did suddenly go away. But then that little sliver of light started shining again. And it was amazing just how quickly it acted. When we think about light, just as it is with darkness, light speaks to something. It speaks to God's presence and God's activity. In Genesis 1, and we saw the same thing from John chapter 1 this morning, that without God there is nothing that's created. That the light itself testifies that God is there. It's the first thing of all that he created because life cannot exist without it. Jesus himself said in John 8 and verse 12, that I am the light of the world, that he who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life. In other places, he also says, such as John 12, 34 through 36, they asked Jesus, we've heard from the law that the Christ remains forever, so how can you say the Son of Man will be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. Jesus let them know that that light was going to be there for a short amount of time. And that was the amount of time that they had in order to respond to those things. Jesus says that he is the one who is the light. It's amazing to me that we live in a, in a time where we believe that we are the most enlightened people on the face of the earth. The most enlightened people that have ever existed. And it is true that we have more knowledge than any other time in history. And there's more information and knowledge that's available so quickly now than any other time in history. But it seems to me that the more knowledge we gain, the darker our lives become. It has done nothing to make our lives more righteous or more godly. It has done nothing to make us better servants of our God. The more we learn, the more we no longer seem to think we need God. So how enlightened are we really? Jesus said, I am the light. And yet he is the one who is dismissed from schools, from work, from society in general. That you can talk about pretty much anything else you want to talk about, but not that Jesus guy, not him. You can promote any type of religion you want to, but not that Christianity stuff. The more we know, the worse it seems we become. Because we draw further and further away from what is just the most simple thing in the world. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. When we go through John 1, and we did this this morning, as we're walking through John 1, we see that Jesus talks about being that light, or it's spoken of about Jesus being that light. John 1, verses 4 and 5, we'll read these quickly again tonight. John 1, verses 4 and 5. In him was life. The life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it, perceive it, wrestle it, could not subdue it. Verses 9 through 12. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. If you go over to chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. Chapter 3, 19 through 21. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light. It does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. 
but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Ephesians 5, 8 through 10. You were once darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. The Scriptures constantly encourage us to realize that the choice that we have is one between right and wrong, good and evil, darkness and light. If you're afraid to come to the Lord, ask yourself a very important question. If you're afraid to come to Him, is it because you know that the things in your life are going to be exposed and that you're admitting before God that I am wrong? That I have sinned against a holy God and I'm deserving of the punishment that He says is fitting. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Trust in God, and that's what Jesus is teaching us. Trust in God that you might be saved. He is the one who's the author of eternal salvation, and he gives it to all those who will believe in him. He gives you the right to be called the child of God. So the question I'm going to leave with you tonight is, is this one. It's very simple. It's, have you seen the light? And if tonight you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you've not yet been baptized for the mission of your sins, and that's your desire this night, if you desire to come back to God, to confess your sins, to be your name uh, put before the throne of God, to have your sins forgiven, whatever that need may be, take care of it tonight. Do not go home tonight with sin in your life when there's something that can be done about it at this particular moment of time. If you're subject to the invitation, won't you please come as we stand and sing to encourage you.